Hello and welcome to another of these Brexit interviews that I'm doing with Professor Tom Brooks of, Do of Durham University. He's the Dean of Law here and also International Politics, is it? Or government? I do a bit of that as well. Government. Yeah. 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 All over the place. It's all fun. Well, in our, in our last interview, we were a bit pressed for time. And I had three things that I really wanted to talk to you about. And we only got to the first one. <laughs> um, I didn't finish that. So thank you for coming back. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming back. But now it did May when she put in her uh, first uh, motion for, for this, uh, this meaningful vote. Yes. That we're supposed to have on December the 11th. Mm. That went all the way down to London. Mm. £138 on the train. And there wasn't a vote, so uh, it got postponed till today. It was so meaningful, she couldn't she yeah, she give it a bit bring more time. herself to, to do it. Right. So uh, <laughs> it's been postponed till 7.30 tonight. So what we talk about here may be incredibly dated within 24 hours of it going online. But um, let's start with the implications for Britain legally when it comes to no deal. And particularly, as far as I've... As far as I've been led to believe, mm -hmm. no deal means there has to be a hard border on the island of Ireland in order for Britain to secure its borders and therefore allow it to renegotiate trade deals with the WTO. Am I, am I reading that right? Yeah, no, that, that's right. Because one of the things that it would mean is that if we are completely out, no deal, all the rest of it, then you have, we need to have a effectively policed border um, and uh, with, with the Republic of Ireland. What, what happens if we don't do that? What if we don't do that? So one of the problems would be that we would, so in not having a border right now, yeah. that part of the reason that's enabled is because the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom are part of this customs union. And what that effectively means, amongst many other things, is that if you want coffee, or other types of things, that the uh, or a cup of tea, that uh, the regulation of the goods and products and services, the taxes or the lack of taxes are the same for each side. Um, and so, um, what why that matters is that you don't need to uh, uh, after you pay your product VAT whatever in Ireland. There's no need to uh, do anything for the UK side, because it's been collected on behalf of this EU thing mm -hmm. they're both a part of on one side of the border or the other. If Britain is out, then it means that the regulation of things is potentially different, that, the, that we've left the club, yeah. and that the taxes and other types of things are also, I think, um, uh, kind of up in the air. Uh, as well. So, the, uh, so in terms of the regulation of goods, that we won't be able to do that on our end, but yeah. the other side uh, can. It would mean a halt to traffic going across uh, the border, that there would have to be checks to make sure uh, things are, are legal, and, uh, and also policing people, because we would not be part of this customs what, what arrangement. What if we just said, well, we don't want to put any, um, we don't want to put any border up at all? What, what difference would it make? What difference would it make? So one of the things that it would, that it would kind of enable, what, what, what it would do, is we would effectively have to have a border, at least on the other side. The, the Irish would then have to do uh, some type of thing because it could be that we would be allowing uh, products or services that would be regulated one way in Britain that would be yeah. out of line with the other side. Now, one of the reasons that would matter is that you could, for example, uh, choose to have lower labor regulations. You could choose to have uh, not, not slave labor, but you could kind of um, have, have different rights, different ways of ensuring quality of products. You could, so you could, you could make a dodgy heater. In, in the UK. You can make a dodgy heater. And then it could go across the border and it doesn't live up to the EU regulations on, on, that's know, right. on, on those things. And so if that gets across the border, um, then that's going to be a problem for the EU. So by us leaving with no deal, forcing the issue because the EU will have to put a border there mm. to stop us from just cheating the system, mm. will that mean that the EU is in contravention of the Good Friday Agreement or will that mean that the UK is in contravention because they have forced 
the EU to... It would mean that the UK is in contravention because the Good Friday Agreement says that there won't be a border. There would be open travel across. And both sides confirmed that that would be the case. And they made this kind of long-lasting commitment to that being true. Yeah. Of course, at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, there was no intention or plan, at least by the overwhelming majorities on all sides, and I mean all sides, yeah. to leave. Um, so well, the that, thought that this would this we'd be in the situation today yeah. was not contemplated then. No, that's exactly what we were told when we were in Belfast uh, a couple of months ago. They you said were told exactly, right. Yeah, they, they, they yeah, said we right. didn't even consider yeah. the fact that you might have different regulations and different um, standards to the rest of the EU. That would be silly. I mean, why would you? If you create a product that you can pretty much only sell in the UK and you can't sell it to your closest neighbours because mm. it doesn't come up to scratch, mm. what's the, the point? You can't export it. So part of the issue of, of dodgy heaters, good example, yeah. or, or a cup of coffee, uh, so that's made, made badly um, on, on one side of the border, and we try to yeah. peddle it um, in, the, in the European Union, the Republic of Ireland. Um, one of the issues is, of course, if we decide to have uh, lower regulations, we, we decide to pay our workers less than uh, or in, in less uh, good conditions as the European Union, maybe we can sell heaters that cost less. Yeah. And maybe people will want to buy them, even if the heaters aren't uh, any good. But they could potentially flood the Irish market and undermine, say, the heater makers there that have stood up by this European standard right, yeah, of yeah. quality and so on. And that is, is part of the issue if, of not having taxes on the border, not uh, checking uh, people or goods. Okay, and as far and as... you can see why the European Union would not want that. Yeah, one of the things that we were told uh, when we were in Geneva, talking to the trade experts over there, they reckon it would be very difficult for Britain to get uh, a trade deal that was anything better than you know maximum tariff regulations of the WTO, which are 160% on frozen beef carcasses, by the way, 40% on lamb, um, uh, to try and bring the, down those tariffs again. You're not making the zero. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but try, to, to try and bring those tariffs back down to zero, yeah. which is what they are at the moment with the EU and many mm -hmm. other countries that the EU has agreements with. Mm. Um, we, we would find that very difficult if we weren't securing our own borders. Mm. Well, I think it would be difficult to do. Yeah. And How's that for a straight yeah. answer? Um, <laughs> but the other thing was that. that was mooted, mm. not by the guys in Geneva, but this mm. was mentioned to us somewhere else. Um, do you think it would be something that the EU could take the UK to The Hague over? Because we would be in contravention of one of the most important peace treaties that the UK has been a signatory to for the last 50 years. Mm. Well, I think it is clear, uh, well, one issue, uh, well, it is clear that if Britain were to do something that were to undermine the Good Friday Agreement, like yeah. have a border in Northern Ireland, uh, in contravention of this treaty, then it would, and it is a treaty. So the Good Friday Agreement is called the Good Friday Agreement. It was signed on Good Friday. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, people agreed. But it's, it's a really, very good Friday. It's a very good Friday, but uh, in more ways than one, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, but it's an tre international treaty, yeah. and it would be clear that Britain would be in contravention because we would be breaking one of the things. So even if we didn't actually put some bricks on the border and start kind of getting the masonry out and doing things ourselves, we would be effectively creating, forcing the need for a border in Northern Ireland wow. in breaking it. And that's one of the reasons why the Prime Minister, and it's been a very... Curious position, to be fair, yeah. of arguing on the one side the need, you know, Brexit's very important. Why? Because Brexit will allow us to control borders. It'll allow us to uh, restrict all those European folks coming uh, coming into this country. Meanwhile, yeah, I'm, we just I'm, won't check anybody coming yeah. in on, on in Northern Ireland. That will be totally open and totally fine. And it makes you wonder. Well, hang on a second. If you're really motivated by setting up a Trump-like wall uh, existence to set up these kind of things to stop people coming in, why are you then so committed to the other side of having it open? Um, and the answer is because of this international treaty yeah. that the, co the country signed up to. And so even if, yeah, so, and that's the kind of, this real tension, I think, that's in the government's uh, 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 the position. So they can't actually leave a customs union with the European Union, because to do so would be to force some type of trade wall, 
uh, in Northern Ireland yeah. that would force some check of some kind of trucks coming back and forth. Sorry, I'm in Britain. Lorries. Um, and it would also be restriction of people. On the one side, you've seen some kind of ultra Brexiteers saying, well, yeah, that's what you do. I mean, they've, they've not been so unionist as to want uh, to care too much about Northern Ireland. But, but even if they don't care about Northern Ireland. Um, so I think it's a mistake. But um, the fact that we would be in contravention of a very important international peace treaty. We could be taking the task on what, that. What happens? What are the consequences for a country that does something like that? Well, no one's been in breach of the Good Friday Agreement yet. But, um, but countries yeah, have been so, in breaches of other peace treaties that have been signed or agreements, international agreements. Say sure. the EU says, right, we're really unhappy about what Britain's done here. We're going to take you to the Hague. Yeah. What, what, what can the Hague do? Has it got any teeth? Can it impose trade sanctions on us? Well, it, it Over seems, and above the trade sanctions yeah, that we're putting on ourselves. Indeed. I mean, it seems certain to me that we would lose. So that's, that's part one. So then the question is, what, what does losing mean? Um, yeah. and, and losing, I think, is obvious, because there is a commitment to have an open border. And to say, oh, we'll keep an open border, um, but um, we're going to be out of all of the regulatory arrangements that enable the open border that this yeah. rests on. Um, and it also rests on um, both sides uh, ad adhering to the European Convention on Human Rights. And there's been thoughts about Britain we, that's separate to the European Union, but there's been talk of by some Brexiteers about leaving that as well uh, in the near future. We, we see that mistake all the time. Jeremy Corbyn kind of conflated the issue on uh, Sunday when he was interviewed by um, Andrew Marr, mm. and he said we're staying in the ECR, uh, the ECHR, mm. and I was just like, but well, hang on, that's got nothing to do with the EU. Why are you even bring that up? It's better going. Oh, we're staying in NATO. We're staying in in the UN. It's like, but. The issue is that the European Court of Justice, which just adjudicates on European law, mm. has been conflated with the European Court of Human Rights. Absolutely which right. Which has it nothing has. to do with it. Russia is a member of, of the European Court of Human Rights, mm. a member of the Council of Europe. Um, and it was set up in the 50s, well, well before the EU as we know, know it today. And so that's something of, of, of an invitation because they, the, the Leave campaign used that as a, a weapon against the EU to say, oh, the European Court of Human Rights is allowing these Muslim terrorists to, to go free and won't let us lock them up. And you're like, uh, if that even was true, it's got nothing to do with the, with the EU. But what you're saying is that we could be taken to task at The Hague f through, from the EU. Mm -hmm. Could we be taken to the European Court of Justice or would that be completely separate once we're out of the EU? Would that, do they have any well, jurisdiction? Well, that, that might be separate if we, okay. if we are out. I think um, a couple of points on what you've said. There's, there's a lot of things that people were saying, of course, about courts and Brexit and what all these things mean. Um, one of the things that people said, of course, that was untrue uh, was that uh, you know, leaving the EU meant that we were necessarily uh, leaving the European Court uh, of, of Human Rights. Yeah. And of course, as you've noted, that they're, they're different things. I do like it to hear at least somebody saying that we also care about the European Convention on Human Rights. We stand by this. We stick up for it. It's nice to hear someone say that whatever the other uh, uh, linguistic uh, <laughs> issues might be around that. But the other thing that I also found very upsetting during the, uh, the discussion for me was people saying that leaving the European Union also meant necessarily leaving freedom of movement, because that is also technically separate. All members of the European Union must subscribe to freedom of movement, but yeah. you can have freedom of movement without being a member of the European Union. Answer, Norway. Will that be the, uh, the model that we will be following in the next uh, well, days? I, mean, the, I don't know. The Norway model would be something that would not keep anybody happy because you've got... Oh, the, no, the... I didn't say anyone would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're but, right. Rule takers, not rule givers, but, uh, and all the rest of that. To go back to the actual... What, what are the punitive measures that we could face if we go into no deal? So we've discussed be taken to the Hague, mm. possibly the European Court of Justice, mm. possibly the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, we, we, would we have international sanctions put on us? And is that I think the issue about sanctions um, and fines and tariffs, I think that would be it. I mean, there will be no court that says effectively um, for something like the Good Friday Agreement that um, you know, Britain's in breach of it. Um, and if Britain really didn't want to be part of the Good Friday Agreement, I don't know why the government would ever want that. But if they really 
you know, no court could force us to remain in a treaty we didn't want to be a part of. Right. But we are a signatory to it. The government has said they want to stay, uh, stay with it. If it were to kind of continue on effectively in bad faith, um, in breach of it, um, in wanting to kind of uh, effectively start a border in Northern Ireland, but without putting up the fence ourselves and leave it to someone else to do, yeah. I then think we would see tariffs. I mean, we would lose. I mean, we would be in breach of it. And we would be told that we would be in breach of it. There would be the decision. Yeah. It would be, all things considered, calamitous uh, for any government. I mean, bringing peace to Ireland. Um, why a government would want to risk this at all um, is um, makes no sense at all to me. Well, nothing in this whole Brexit business but makes sense. Very little makes sense. sense. Uh, yeah, that's right. But I think that... We would see, I think, a very big monetary fine, potentially big tariffs. Yeah. We would be called out for what we would do. Um, we would be given a time frame under which to kind of either um, t to leave the Good Friday Agreement altogether. I'm, I'm, this is purely hypothetical, yeah. or to kind of get things right. You know, told 60 days, 90 days that you yeah. either get your, get yourselves in line with this to keep that border open, um, as per the treaty that you agreed. Now, who would be adjudicating this is an interesting uh, matter. I mean, this would be a kind of thing that we might see ourselves being put in front of the Hague at. Normally, uh, the, the uh, court that would hear us out would be the European Court of Justice. One of the things I find uh, hilarious uh, in a cynical way about this whole debate is this thought about, hey, look, if we leave the European Union, that would be great because then, you know, it would be our courts, you know, the, the yeah. highest court in the land would be ours. Of course, it, it is already the highest court of this land. There is no thing about British law in Britain that can that is higher than the UK Supreme Court. On the other hand, of course, The Hague will always be there that could uh, rain down on us if it wanted to at any time. And no one's calling for us to leave yeah. things around war crimes uh, or, or international terrorism. So that will always hang over. Uh, our national court. But the other thing is, so if we have all these wonderful trade deals, one of the things that happens with trade deals, so let me help out uh, listeners, one of the things that happens is, you're country A, I like you, we'll put you A, I'm country B, country Brooks. Um, so we come to a deal. What happens if um, we disagree? on whether, or not, you know, I say you broke the terms of a treaty and you say I broke the terms. Yeah. Uh, is it your national court that decides things or is it mine? Answer, neither. What happens is that we agree for some international body to do yeah. this. Right, yeah. now we might both agree on the European Court of Justice, we might both agree on the WTO, we might agree on some other body. One of the many things that people do is you say, look, I'm going to appoint someone from country A to be on this panel. Yeah. I'm going to appoint someone from country B, and we'll have someone from country C somewhere else, Costa Rica, something different. I don't know where my coffee's come from. Yeah. Um, so to like be when the you're head, having, head judge. having a football match at the World Cup, you generally don't have a referee who's from one of the countries exactly. that's playing. You'd have something like that. Now, why is that? Why do I, that, does that amuse me in a cynical way? Because that is effectively the European Court of Justice. Right. It's effectively one of everybody, including Britain, yeah. that adjudicates on matters affecting Britain and other countries. And the we would have a smaller yeah. scale version of that yeah. between us and the EU. If we, couldn't agree, more money. if we couldn't but agree the ECJ what, what, with still someone from Britain on it. So, so if I was a, a lamb farmer, a uh, sheep farmer from Wales, and I was selling my lamb, suddenly we leave without a deal. I'm hit with a 40% tariff. For ninety percent of my land, which is how much I sell to the EU, yeah, then it goes. That's bad. We get dragged. It is bad. Yeah. And then we get because it's not like you know, it's, it's like nowhere else in the world has sheep. I mean, yeah. Obviously, it's it's a crowded, very competitive global marketplace, it is. and we are putting tolls on our own motorway. Yeah, when they didn't used to be any there. Tolls against freedom of travel, transport, and, and trade, and services, and 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 people, um, but. In, in, if we take this to its like, almost absurd conclusion, we could not only see the maximum WTO tariff slapped on us, mm. which are 40% on mm -hmm. them, we could also see sanctions, punitive tariffs mm. slapped on us, because that's what 
happens to naughty countries when they're naughty. Mm -hmm. You don't usually slap them on yourselves, Britain. And um, it won't be a tariff in general. It would be yeah. about specific things. So, so it, it would be, be like our main exports, though, wouldn't it? I mean, if we could were be. Iran, it would be oil. Could be. It'd be like you've got a tariff on your oil, so people buy oil from other places. Mm -hmm. But then we've got this other threat looming from your side of the pond which is the fact that Donald Trump has said that he's considering pulling the US out of the WTO. Yeah. And that means the WTO wow. collapses and that means no max tariff. Any country could set any tariff it wanted. Mm. So if you know, you're really wanted to punish us, which I don't think they do, but you know, if it wanted to, mm. it could say 200%, 500%. Mm. Well, uh, one point worth making immediately uh, that I'm sure will be of intense interest to uh, viewers is that a possible motivation for Donald Trump doing this is because one of the people being flouted to lead the WTO yeah. is his daughter. And that might be a motivation for why Trump is threatening to sink the whole thing. What? He thinks that uh, Ivanka should potentially, it's one of the names rumored by his members of staff to lead the WTO. I don't make anything up like this. I make up things, you know, Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, this is Halloween. It's not yeah. my Halloween's going once. <laughs> ah, what yeah. A show. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. All right, well. The Saints come the following day. So, yeah. so just saying. So, so no deal is that's technically that. in, in, in international law. So forget yep. about the devastation yep. to UK businesses and agriculture yeah. that will come about as all the tariffs get slapped into place. I also mentioned that, that the WTO's the president is normally chosen by the Americans and the Europeans choose the IMF. Again, that's yeah. why Ivanka comes into this. Oh, right. But, okay. But you're right about those things, but let me first... So all this stuff is really bad for your Welsh uh, lamb uh, uh, herders and, yeah. and, and their friends. But what makes things perhaps also worse is that... It, right now in the EU, you have something called the Common Agricultural Policy, yeah. right? So there is some type of assistance that people in the agricultural sector can receive. Put aside issues around migration for one moment that are going to be a problem uh, at yeah. Brexit because um, uh, that has been deemed low-skilled and to be restricted. But, um, and so there'd be a real problem there as well. But the Common Agricultural Policy, so there's supposed to be some extra... Um, subsidies, some support to help the agricultural sector. Very controversial um, how that works across Europe and so on. Okay. Now the government is saying, oh, well, of course we will um, support um, all this stuff. For two years. For two years. Yeah. During, <laughs> during what? During the transition period. What happens if there's no deal? What don't you have? Transition period. You don't have a thing top of the class. So you don't have a transition period. So you won't have this for two years. And where's this money supposed to be coming from? Uh, the oh, same geez. part of money? I'm so glad I'm not a farmer. Yeah, well. I'm so glad I'm not a farmer who voted for this either. Well, it's, it, it, it's just <laughs> really difficult. I'll be like, what It's difficult done? to see where exactly the money is going to come from because there's been yeah. no planning to kind of uh, uh, find extra cash yeah. to throw at something like this. The government said that it will replace the funding to farmers and yeah. other sectors over the two years, but this money is allegedly, yeah. according to Philip Hammond, to be clawed back from the money that we're supposed to otherwise be giving to the European Union. Now, of course, if that money that would otherwise be going to the European Union is going to pay for, um, I don't know, um, border checks, um, to set up the, the new regulatory agencies that we're going to need to shadow, if not mirror, the yeah. EU institutions that are going to be closed as maybe, of maybe, the 30th of March. Maybe it could be do, doing something about the 800 billion pounds of assets that's apparently left the city of London already, according to the FT this week. Those are some thoughts. Um, that's over 1% of all of the GDP of the world. Gone. Frankfurt, uh, Dublin, Paris. It's not coming back. Well, it's a very big problem. Trillion dollars. And uh, well, as, I, as I've said, <laughs> it will be a problem for the government to find the cash uh, overnight to uh, find, because even uh, doing anything uh, very kind of strong in that kind of direction yeah. would not be able to happen overnight. No. Um, and so there's this real issue about over the next weeks, months, two years, transition or no transition, yeah. Where will that extra cash go to replace that funding to help farmers 
yeah. not from an agricultural sector. It's not clear to me that it would but happen, it, especially if yeah. you have these sanctions come in and other things from violating the Good Friday Agreement and so well, on. When we talk about helping farmers, it's it, it that sounds a little bit, and I know it'll probably get up the noses of, of Brexiteers watching this, they're going, why are we helping farmers? Why, why are we giving these, these farmers benefits? Mm. And the, the fact is that to, to try and produce stuff like I was talking to a guy from the NFU, the National Farmers yeah. Union, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me, you know, he's he, he's a cereal farmer. Taking a hard time. And mm. the profits to be made on growing things like wheat are very very low. That's In right. fact, if he was just relying on his profits alone to live off, he'll be on about two or three thousand pounds a year. Mm. And the EU subsidies top him up because obviously, if you're take getting food from another country where the labor costs are zero mm. you can make that food a lot cheaper mm. and so to protect our farmers mm. and give them you know a decent standard of living we have these subsidies so you take them away mm. those farmers are going to have to change what they make mm. and also we're going to be flooded with cheap imports from abroad. Some people used to call this food security, um, that that was a really important thing for our national security yeah. to be able to produce some amount of food in the country and not be entirely reliant for our butter, uh, our bread and, yeah. uh, and so on uh, from abroad, just in case there were problems elsewhere, yeah. um, that we would be able to produce things ourselves. Well, we had that food security with the EU, because if sure. there was a drought in Greece and we could, we could move our produce, we get things uh, somewhere, get things somewhere else. else. And we, yeah. we also had folks here who could do it. Of course, the alternative to not subsidizing, so, so the alternative to, to you and I paying a small amount that goes into, so we can argue about how much the money is, but you and I paying a small amount effectively that yeah. goes through British tax, that goes into this uh, agricultural fund, that effectively uh, allows the farmers to survive, more yeah. or less. And it's already, I think, a declining industry. It's one that, that you don't see more people, it's not a sector that's growing in the UK. If anything, it's been one that's been, I think, effectively struggling. Now, if we don't do something like this, then the, the, the alternative is that we are all pay an awful lot more um, for our milk, for our butter, for our bread, and everything else, because you won't have this common pot to help not just subsidize what's going on, but also to help coordinate uh, what is going on. And so it'll be a lot more difficult for what few mom and pop and smaller farms you see to survive. It will be a lot, you know, the only thing that will be able to survive will be the even bigger super farms. Large scale like, industrial yeah, farming. Even which, more of that and yeah. fewer of them. Which won't necessarily look after the environment. Things no. like hedgerows will be gone. We've got, we've got thousands of miles of hedgerows, which are really important for small animals, birds, right. things like that, wildlife. And but but they're not making food. And mm. um, what would be more cost effective is to have a barbed wire fence instead. Yes. do the same job, but obviously doesn't provide any habitat. Um, so it would be not just an economic disaster, we're mm. talking about an environmental disaster. Mm. And anyone like me who grew up in the 80s and went to British beaches in the 80s can testify that the EU, if nothing else, has done a lot for the environmental standards of the United Kingdom. They've cleaned our beaches up, you know, or forced us to clean our beaches up, which is more than the government did. Mm. So um, that was my first question, which was about the, uh, the legal situation with the Good Friday Agreement and whether no deal is a legal thing to do. Because mm -hmm. under international law, mm. it is just default illegal, isn't it? Yeah. It's break, breaking a treaty. Yes. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're Straight in, answer. We're, we went over to Brussels and chatted to uh, people over there and they said to us that, uh, you know what, if Luxembourg wants to leave, it'll be fairly straightforward, but Britain is the most complex country to take out of the EU because of the Good Friday Agreements, because of the, the land borders it, you know, it shares with, the, with the, the Republic of Ireland. Um, so the next part, and, and you might shoot me down with this and might say with this, this bit of the conversation might not go anywhere, but... Um, as far as I'm aware, mm -hmm. um, under the bilateral investment treaties that we have, is countries around the world. Yes. And the companies that have come to the UK mm -hmm. and invested over a trillion pounds, 1.1 trillion pounds in the last few decades mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom because it was the gateway to Europe. We're shutting that gate and we are costing these companies billions by mm -hmm. shutting that gate. Mm -hmm. For example, if you are a large manuf uh, pharmaceutical company, and you could be a British company, you don't necessarily have to be a foreign company to be affected yeah. by this, um, and you make your product, uh, your pharmaceutical product in uh, the UK. Yeah. If you, at the moment, you can test it in the UK. You can test each batch before it goes out in the UK. Now, if we leave without a deal, or even if we leave with a deal, the, 
every batch is going to have to be retested on European Union soil. And the reason is because we're part of the European Union, there's a series of kind of regulations as to how you test pharmaceutical products yeah. in a way that effectively, um, when, when the tests say this works or this doesn't work, that throughout the European Union, wherever that test was taken, or wherever that result, that we've got confidence in that result. If we leave, then maybe we'll keep doing stuff the same way we did it, but we would need to be effectively recertified in a way I don't yeah. know if the European Union does with any other country yeah. to ensure that we've got that. And I could see incentives for the EU not to want to do that because if they were only certifying according to their own standards, yeah. their own producers, experimenters, and so on and so forth, then they keep that investment, that knowledge internal. There yeah. will also be data protection issues around that that will be policed within the European Union as well. So I suspect that, that so part of this is about the standards, and, and that's why, for example, if you're, um, why um, leaving countries that are not part of this, why they might say, well look, the Americans might have said that's okay, yeah. this test worked for them, but um, it won't work for us. And the reasons might be um, that EU standards are more rigorous. EU standards are. are, well, I'm sure they are. <laughs> they are. Hey, hey, I left America <laughs> so, so I'm, uh, for, for, uh, for here inside the European Union. So, um, so standards are more rigorous here, that uh, we've got more uh, 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 a confidence in our process, and maybe things are more ethically done as well, uh, where animals are used, that it's done in a more humane way than, say, United States or other countries. Yeah. Those would be the kinds of reasons why the EU would say, you need to be part of our club, be part of our regulatory body, and then we've got confidence in your results. Um, and those yeah. who are not part of this, why we won't have confidence, at least not subject to further checks to make sure things are okay. I'll throw something, there's, the, there's an additional reason that, that's very interesting here. Of course, Britain, as a member of the European Union, had uh, uh, the opportunity to host some of the EU's headquarters for regulations, and yeah. one of them was on pharmaceuticals. Yeah, was, yeah. And losing yeah, that man. is particularly bad. Yeah, because it means that uh, the, the folks who were quite literally in charge of uh, signing off on tests were all right, products were safe to use, or products were not safe to use. Yeah. This is all happening right here in the good old U of K. Um, and uh, in leaving the European Union, well, in making the decisions that have already been made, yeah. that headquarters is already leaving. Yeah. So yeah. even if we stay in or with one foot in, or both feet in, or other combinations of toes and other digits, yeah. uh, that's gone. Yeah, and it's going to be devastating. I mean, going to be gone. The, the whole thing's devastating anyway. We the, lose out. The 800 billion pounds that has already left City of London is one thing. Um, take, for example, uh, the bigger, one of the biggest British pharmaceutical firms, which is AstraZeneca. Yes. It represents 1% of Britain's export GDP. It's one company. Represents more of our export GDP than our entire fishing industry put together. Okay, I believe one it. company, one company. So they produce a particular drug mm -hmm. that is now tested in the UK. If we leave with a deal or without a deal, and we have different regulations to Europe, we will have to retest that stuff in a lab somewhere else. Now, for incredibly complex, cutting-edge anti-cancer medication, mm -hmm. testing it is really, really difficult. It's not just a case of just putting it in a picture dish and dripping something on That's it right. and seeing what color it goes. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about robotics, you're talking about microscopes, you're talking about all this kind of stuff that they need to set up. And that's a huge expense for a British company that they would not otherwise have to and pay. And also a huge cost in yeah. terms of uh, people and so on, because you're experimenting so, on people. So you're a car manufacturer, the, the EU tariffs, I think, on car parts and cars is 9.8%, so you'll be paying that coming in, you'll be paying that going out. 20% markup on any British-made car, compared with an Irish-made car, or a French-made car, or a, a, a German-made car. So why would anyone buy our cars? Then you've got this problem with the stuff that we make here and then we export, forget about tariffs, maybe it's tariff free, like medication I think is tariff free. You still have this problem with, 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 um, with having a different uh, re re regulation. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so these companies, if I was running these companies, yes. I'd want to sue. I'd want some money off the British government for doing this. What, yeah. what, where would I start? 
Well, I think that it is a curiosity that, um, or unfortunate uh, situation we find ourselves in, that a lot of communities where there had been strong manufacturing once upon a time, such as not far from here in Durham, in Redcar, um, where they saw a decline in manufacturing, people seem to have kind of reacted to that decline and saying we want to vote out and take back control and all other kinds of stuff. But the problem is that in, in leaving, it is certainly, un, it's, it's at best unclear to me how that could possibly help manufacturing um, kind of be revitalized. Um, there's already problems of globalization anyway, and it strikes me being on our own will make things worse. So maybe a certain sector could come back, but the jobs are not going to be paid as well. The regulation of it won't be as strong. Um, uh, it's not going to make a situation better. If anything, things will continue to be uh, in decline. Now, who do I sue? So I've got a big plant. Uh, yep. Whether I'm producing drugs or, or so steel. So imagine you're, you're the, the, you're the uh, you've won Jaguar Land Rover. Yes. Uh, Boris Johnson knows more about car manufacturing than you do. Don't apparently, forget. Apparently. Um, so tell us. What, what he may well know more about it than you're, I You've had to relocate your factories to uh, Slovakia, Austria, and China. Um, right. It's costing you a lot of money. What, what would you do? Well, I think that, um, I'm, I think in terms of the, the legal uh, aspect, I'm not sure there'd be anyone necessarily to sue. Insofar as um, making the decision to invest will be a decision for each company and its board. Yeah. Um, and uh, they will be doing it, taking information. They may well be very angry with uh, various ministers for the private conversations and assurances they felt they were getting. But, um, the, but I think that the fact that there was a referendum, that Parliament is sovereign, Parliament voted to trigger Article 50, Parliament will be voting today on whether or not well, to the, accept the, this the, deal. The, um, the there referendum will be no right against that. legally was advisory. It was, it, was up advisory. The, it was up to the government to say whether it respected the results of it. That's right. Um, the, the Russian-backed fraud referendum, as I like to call it. Um, but the, 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 what we were told when uh, Jason and I do the free blokes uh, mm -hmm. thing. Um, when we were traveling around Europe, asking about this, they mm -hmm. said, well, look, there's no way that the companies themselves can actually cause trouble for the United Kingdom, but their governments can, their representative governments can. So if, so forget about Jaguar Land Rover for a mm -hmm. second, but say you're Nissan, yeah. Toyota, and you go to the Japanese government and say, hey, we've invested billions of pounds in Sunderland or yeah. whatever. And on the basis that we could sell our cars for a competitive price. Yes. And surely as part of that bilateral investment treaty, that bit, they have some grounds for, whether they win or not, mm. taking us to some, court of court, some kind of court of arbitration. Now on this, I mean, the, the nerdy legalese will be, it depends on the fine print of the bilateral agreement. Yeah. So if there was something in there about um, trade each way that was um, within certain sectors or something you could kind of really pin down, yeah. and that was kind of could be shown that was breached in uh, the, the referendum, then, then there's a possibility of, of some hope of going down that road. I think on the whole, um, I think what you'll mostly see, I, I mean, I, is a lot of people very upset and taking their investment elsewhere. I think Jaguar and Land Rover can make life very difficult for a government by doing things like, um, you know, well, at the moment, of deciding to move operations elsewhere and saying to people, there'll be a lot of folks who will be at the plant to, uh, or, and other businesses that will be affected by Brexit, where um, people were maybe hoping for promotion we're hoping to give friends jobs, hoping to kind of advance themselves and find out, uh, goodness me, uh, there's not going to be any bonus this year. There's yeah. not going to be that manager role this year. This job on this temporary contract to make cars over this period of time, it's going to come to an end. And and if those companies could be make very clear, the reason for this is Brexit. Um, I think that one of the reasons why there hasn't been as decisive a move away from leave as we could have seen yeah. is been, you know, people said, well, look, Project Fear, uh, the country voted out and look, the sky is still there and the ceiling hasn't collapsed. I think that that is because people don't yet know quite what Brexit is. And I think that right now, if you were to talk to most people in the city uh, privately, 
they yeah. will tell you that they don't genuinely believe a real Brexit is going to happen. They think something very, very soft, something maybe in name only, at worst, is going to happen, and that no deal will be stopped one way or another. Because um, I think, uh, and because they don't see envisage any major change actually happening, that one way or another it will be stopped, um, that's why you don't see uh, the calamity, because nothing has actually changed. If, if that's the case, though, why, even is, a transition period, why are we talking about hundreds of billions of pounds worth of assets moving out of the city of London? Well, you see that, well, you see that happening right now, because uh, even if there is this transition, even if there is this kind of soft, of soft Brexit, the rock country uh, companies that, of course, are fairly conservative, they're, they're, you know, that um, uh, there is a concern, amongst many other things, about, yeah. say, the lawyers. Uh, so the lawyers kind of registering themselves in Dublin um, and having that Irish certification so they can continue uh, to advise uh, in Europe and on the same terms, same yeah. conditions, having no change to that. You're seeing some types of things like this, Lloyds of London playing it very safe, moving each quarters, uh, their headquarters um, so it's abroad. Not, not Lloyds of London anymore after 400 years, is it? Literally, uh, oh, I think, yeah, it might have it on the logo, but that'll be in, 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 in name, name only. only. Yeah. In name only. Um, so things moving abroad. So there is this kind of shift you see there. I think that kind of the big decisive calamitous thing, I think um, people waiting to see what the, the, the fine print is. And this is actually the, the underlying the calamity of everything, that in a couple months, we could be out with no deal, with yeah. nothing, with literally no one to uh, someone's French, Italian coming to the UK. Well, what do we do then? And, and don't forget, no deal means no deals with yeah. anyone. Yeah. We, all there's, of there's our trade no deals go through the EU. So if we're part no of the EU, we lose all of our trade deals with all the other countries in the there's, world. There's no arrangement. And have to start renegotiating them from scratch from a much weaker position Instead of being a group of 28 countries worth over $17 trillion uh, in GDP uh, and representing over 500 million people, will be a tenth of that. You know, it, it's, Apparently, it, a number of government departments, this is not gossip, this is true, yeah. a number of government departments have been telling um, civil servants over the last uh, week uh, that uh, really they're to focus on essential services only and that they are directing more and more of staff from the Department of Education and elsewhere to not doing anything about the Department of Education work, but to focus purely on planning for a no Brexit, uh, no deal Brexit. And that is the level of planning, uh, all hands on deck. Nothing else will happen. Quite literally everything coming to a halt. Okay, how, how long have I got you for? Have I got you for a little bit longer? 20 or? minutes. 20 minutes, okay, so. I'm having fun. Can I sue the government? Well, I think that's that lying, be... cheating, breaking the law, obstructing justice. Theresa May told the National Crime Agency not to investigate Ivan Banks two years ago. Yes, well, there's a lot there's going a, on here. There's a lot going on here. I think that it's it's really quite extraordinary that um, <laughs> the situation we find ourselves in. Can any individual sue the government for Brexit happening? No, I no, 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 no. For no. the government for breaking the law. Government breaking the law. I mean, I'm sure the fact that four billion pounds of taxpayers' money has been put aside to prepare for a no-deal Brexit and they're doling it out to their mates for a ferry company that doesn't have any ferries, I'm sure there's some yes. kind of legal obligation not to do that by the government because I'm assuming that would be the case if you had a company and you had your shareholders you were answerable to and you spent loads of money on your mate's ferry company that had no ferries and couldn't possibly have any ferries because mm. the type of ferries that they need to go from that particular port can't, the, 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 there's not available mm. and none that can be built in the next two months. Um, so it, surely if we can prove in a court of law that the government acted in a way that was against the law, can we get these ministers in jail? Can we sue them? What, what can we do? Well, I think, you know, in terms of the, the ferry operation uh, situation, uh, it was claimed that uh, there was the usual tender process. It was claimed that uh, due diligence and so on was done of the different operators who uh, went through. I think that the, the way forward would be to effectively uh, challenge all that stuff in, in court. Um, I, I would imagine, so it is ridiculous that a company that has never owned ferries, let alone operated them, is somehow in charge of things like 
Chris Grayling uh, gave it to. But I think that um, it would be interesting to see who else was part of that process, yeah. uh, how due diligence was done. He claimed that, well, we're just supporting a British uh, business. Well, was he uh, prioritizing a company based on nationality? Uh, grounds that could get him into potential hot water. Trouble with the and government also, procurement agreements. And also, you know, looking at who's on the board and was there due diligence of members of that board? Were there kind of question marks over yeah. uh, their past dealings that should have been uh, raised to ministers' attention or not? I'll allow others to investigate this, but those would be matters in which I would advise um, kind of looking into um, uh, that, uh, looking at those kinds of arrangements. I think it's difficult. So, Going to something else, say um, mm. investigating the um, uh, violations of campaign finance and related things around um, the referendum, I think it's been shameful that the government has done nothing, literally nothing on that. The Electoral Commission has found more than one person um, in breach uh, of electoral laws, given the maximum fine. People have been reported to the National Crime Agency. Maximum fine, which is what, £70,000? £20,000. £20,000 £20, £20, for what, a half million overspend, was it? 10% overspend? I thought it was £600,000. £600,000. Yeah, we, we, why mince that? Why uh, quibble over yeah, uh, exactly. £100,000, which is, you know, more it's than... It's extraordinary. Uh, most people in this country will... will but, but more most, money than they'll see in half have been, have been referred to the National Crime Agency. I think the official government position is they're waiting to see what happens from this. But I find it extraordinary because that would only be the, 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 the couple of, of people or organizations that have been were highlighted by the Electoral Commission yeah. as in violation of electoral laws. This has not been kind of a proactive basis. This has been what? Private Eye magazine yeah. and some others saying, Kavakopala. hey, see this? Yeah, uh, yeah and Carol. Absolutely. Yeah. Carol's been terrific in this highlighting these issues. And that's been great. But Observer, uh, Guardian uh, journalists are, uh, and other newspapers are terrific and wonderful and great and amazing, and they're not special prosecutors, yes. right? So, however wonderful they are, they are doing things to their own craft, trying to discover what they can discover, to get any whistleblowers that they can find, and they don't have any powers of subpoena. They can't hold people in front of them to give evidence, whether it be in public or in private. They can just say, hi, uh, Aaron Banks, you know, or other people, it's fancy a chat, yeah. um, and, and hope they can get somewhere. I think it's shameful. I may have said this to you before. If not, I, you know, yeah, you um, did, I, did about, I, like, I, at I least will, in America, that they're in I something. I will say it again. And I think it's a point worth saying again and again, that to the United States, in a country that is more polarized, in a country that is more partisan, where the right is more right. Um, I want, you know, Bernie Sanders, not, not I wish either. it was the, well, <laughs> no, definitely not morally, but more right, where the right wing is even more extreme right wing. They had nothing to gain in a special prosecutor going, looking into Trump and, and, and the uh, foreign alleged, at the time, foreign interference in the election. Nothing to gain from a president who was largely campaigning against many of the Republicans because in doing so was going to mean that what progress they could make with the Republican White House in a, with a Republican Congress would be made all that more difficult because it would upset him. He's very easy to upset. Anyway, they did it, and to their great credit, and to the shame of the British government in failing to do the same here. I don't know what the motivation well, can, is can, can for Theresa May not doing this. But can any MP push for this? Does it have to be the government? Well, because we get select committees, we get cross, cross, cross benches, we get people in the House of Lords. Surely they've got some powers to say we want an investigation into this. We want it done properly, and and in, you know maybe even shame the government into saying, okay, we'll allow a special prosecutor to, to gather the evidence that vote leave broke the law, which we know they did. Yeah. Leave.eu broke the law, mm. and people go on about this leaflet that was sent out to uh, every every um, every household in the UK, like this was something that shouldn't have happened. Hmm. My problem with the leaflet is it was a leaflet. If the referendum had been held in a sensible country like Ireland that has a lot of referendums, hmm. it would have been a booklet telling you everything that you needed to know. Hmm. But we didn't get that. No. We got a, a, a bunch of 
you know, tea leaf reading and crystal ball gazing about what might happen yeah. in the event that we leave. And that was, you know, some of it was true, some of it wasn't, some of it was hyperbole. True. But as far as the people selling us leaving, every single thing they said was an absolute lie. Well, I think that one of the one of the things that makes this whole issue so such a problem is it was it was handled so badly and then and then it led to a result. And so what I mean by that is David Cameron and company never really thought through what leaving would mean um, or how what that would work. And in the government's official kind of line on this stuff, um, it really put everything on kind of obviously will remain. And remind ourselves that David Cameron supported the referendum for the very clear reason of killing off UKIP. UKIP was not winning any seats in Parliament, but they were stopping Tories from winning seats in Parliament. David Cameron did not like being in a coalition in the run-up to the 2015 election, where it was predicted that it was going to be another coalition, but they didn't. people didn't know what the yeah. makeup was going to be. He said, no reason to vote for UKIP, which is promising a referendum on the EU, because all offer you the referendum. And then as soon as he won, oh my, um, a small majority. Uh, he decides to hold it immediately, within a year. Why? To capitalize on, everyone just voted for him. He must be popular. So we'll, we'll do another one. Hey, and I'll front it. And, and everyone will back me again, because, well, why won't they? They didn't go for the other people as much. Um, and, and with Miliband gone, with lots of controversy over who the leader of the Labour Party will be and, and challenges, thought, you know, I'll have a straight go for this and surely we'll, we'll win this. And of course, with no real thought about leaving, that was uh, uh, one thing that went very badly wrong. And another thing that went very badly wrong worth highlighting is I spoke to uh, the student leader for the national Vote Leave campaign, not the Believe, Vote Leave, they're friends. But, but the Vote Leave side. They all cheated. The student leader Vote Leave. And I said to him after a, a debate that happened here at Durham University, where I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced I wiped the floor, um, was uh, for Remain. Um, said to him afterwards, said, you know, why isn't Vote Leave doing what uh, the SNP gover led government did in Scotland on the Scotland independence uh, 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 vote? And I thought a lot of things about that referendum were uh, very worrying, the, the toxic nature of the debate at the time, um, very heated public discussions. But one of the things that the Scottish government, I thought at the time, did very, very well was it produced Scotland's Future. Yes. I have a copy of it in my office yes. if you want to go down that Blueprint road. for what a future Scotland might look like. Exactly. Yeah. People can like it, people can not like it. That is immaterial. That's why they're having a vote, for people yeah. could express a preference. But you saw... If Alex Salmond became the leader with blue face paint and all the rest of it, Braveheart style e of a newly independent Scotland, uh, the intention was to keep the pound, to keep the queen, yeah. to get rid of the citizenship test. They're yeah. going to open up the border a lot more. They're going to have a different immigration regulatory frame, state of the European Union, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You had a sense of what they're going to do, and they spelled it out on economy, immigration, counterterrorism, and so on. People cannot like it. People can think it's it's a load of uh, a baloney, but it's what they were going to do. Yeah. And so and there it was. And I said, why didn't you guys do this too? And he looked at me with a big smile and said, Tom, we learn from Scotland. Don't forget, he said, Scotland lost. And he thought one of the reasons why Scotland lost was they had a plan. Yeah, the you could look at the plan and say, well, these numbers aren't quite accurate. And people could kind of lay Pick attention, critical detention, to the detail. They didn't want the debate to be around the detail. What you want they wanted to do about is you want to flood Facebook with targeted adverts that are paid for by Vladimir Putin, essentially, um, which basically say that the EU wants to ban tea. Or what you want to do is say, if, uh, if you, know, you, like, uh, one, you know, you like the color blue and I like the color red and someone else likes the color green, um, say, hey, we can all, you know, you can have what you want and you can have what you want. You get different voices for everything with no one accountable for the final result and promising everything but there's a court to get case people across the line. At and the, the thought was to get these different coalitions of the willing, that was a phrase used to me, coalitions of the willing, disparate, if not contradictory perspectives on what people wanted from Brexit and the genuine belief 
that the EU was just going to kind of cave in. Yeah. They were just going to give us the cherry picking. It was going to happen. Wait and see. I was told. Well, well, we waited, we waited. and I saw. We saw, and, and it, and it, and it went happen. down exactly as, right. as we predicted it was, which has just been an absolute disaster for the United Kingdom. An absolute, absolute, absolute disaster. It even if it way. stops today, mm. even if in Parliament tonight they they, they back the old Theresa May's terrible deal, they won't. And, and then they say, <laughs> uh, and then they say, uh, no, back heel, like get oh, rid of yeah, it, yeah. Um, which they will. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Even if they, and, and they turn around and say, listen, let's just stop Brexit tonight. Let's stop Brexit. The damage it's already done financially, economically, and to the reputation of the United Kingdom around the world will take a generation to sort out. One of the things that's worth looking at this, Graham, and you're absolutely right, is that there's countries that have leaders that are Eurosceptic. Italy, Austria, Hungary, amongst others. And one of the things that's fascinating about this is that they will say things about, well, they wish the EU migration system was different, so on and so forth. Uh, none of them are calling for their countries to leave the European Union. I mean, one of the things that's been very successful from the EU side is whatever Britain does next, people are looking at this from their countries, from those Eurosceptic positions saying, ooh, yeah, well, this we is be a mess. right now. Yeah, I, and they don't have Good Friday agreements to sort out, and they don't have other things. And some of these countries actually are on the EU border, and they have pressing challenges and other things going on. No, not looking very attractive. We are better in than out. Whatever the problems are, um, yeah. it, being part of any club, any relationship takes work. Um, yeah. Nothing is, is, is ever 100%, but the benefits um, of, of staying in are better than leaving out. There is this issue, I think, that all the countries have recognized of having to sell this better, that the importance yeah. of being in Europe, uh, more could be done on this, but, but leaving and the problems with that are kind of in technicolor now for across, uh, across the EU. Yeah, and, um, but still not in the UK, because we are just been, we're being cowed and lied to by our tabloid press for the last 30 years, and they, they're still not backing down. Well, I think one of the, one of the big mistakes, one of the big uh, lies um, of the last, um, one of the big howlers of the last year or two has been this very calamitous mistake of the Prime Minister showing that she has fa would have failed my negotiation for Lawyers 101. Uh, class of starting the talk. So when you start a talk, so you usually have a skeleton position, an outline of basically where you want to go. You can chart it off. I show students in, yeah. uh, in my class on how to chart how you want to do a negotiation um, to start um, you know, talks and arbitrate for getting from A to B. You don't kind of start off from a position of, yes, you, 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 you suspect that Everything you want might be a little bit not what you're going to get, but you have a sense about where you want to go, make a reasonable case for that position with the expectation that you will be some degree a bit short of that in, in yeah. the give and take on both sides. But you don't start off by saying and doing stuff that is absolutely not going to happen. For example, I'm only going to give you one. For example, saying something like, no deal is better than bad deal. Now, at the time, people said, what crack are you smoking? You know, because this is just nuts. You're doing brain damage to yourself, um, thinking something like this. This is toxic. It is absolutely false. There was no, whatever the problems are of treasury reports and forecasting into a few weeks or a few years into the future, none of this had no deal looking any good. And this is going to be calamitous. And what are the problems of the Prime Minister saying that? And then in her position now, she now is saying, oh my God, no deal really is bad. Um, we really can't manage this. But people have been saying, well, Prime Minister, as you said, no deal is better than a bad deal. And I think this is a bad deal. And so... It's terrifying. No deal is it's, all right. it's terrifying how you many people. You said no deal is okay. It, it's terrifying how many people out there um, honestly believe no deal, no problem. I've seen the placards outside Parliament. No deal, no problem. And you're like, no deal means no deals. It means we have nothing set up to facilitate our trade with the rest of the world. Historical perspective. Historical perspectives for the benefits of your learned uh, uh, viewers um, is. 
uh, around the time of the referendum campaign and the start of this Brexit mess, we were told by a chap called David Davis, later uh, Brexit secretary, not to worry about no deal. It was never going to happen because the German automakers were never going to allow uh, Angela Merkel to see Britain walk off for the deal. Dr. Liam Fox, uh, uh, as International Trade Secretary, said not to worry about no deal it was never going to happen because on the 29th of March, 2019, I'm holding him to it, so should you, if the government wins the vote today, which they won't, um, he said 40, 4 zero, 40 trade deals signed midnight, 29th of March. That was going to happen. Why? I quote, the easiest trade deals in human history. Human history. Human history. history. So, I think whatever, I mean, whatever the truth veracity uh, of those claims, <laughs> there's no truth to those claims. It's absolute BS. But they said those things. The point is that from the get-go, during the referendum campaign, we were told that those saying no deal was going to happen and all the bad things that no deal was, this was, I quote, Jacob rees Project Fear. No deal was Project Fear. It was never going to happen. You know, ridiculous. You remainers, you were so wrong. We were how, never going to get a no how deal. How were we, we Project were Fear when deal. we said this is going to be a bad thing for the country, which was true, mm. but it wasn't Project Fear to send someone who liked animals uh, an advert on Facebook saying the EU is killing the polar bears. Or someone who likes tea, which is pretty much everybody. Uh, the <laughs> EU me. wants to ban I've your kettle. Coffee. The EU wants <laughs> to right. ban your kettle. Yeah. And people got this and went, oh, God, I didn't know that. Boris Johnson said that bananas had to be a certain way that wasn't true. A 10% overspend for a 1% vote swing in an advisory referendum where the biggest political donation of all time from Aaron Banks uh, was a eight, eight million pounds. And he can't tell us where that eight million came from. One of the, the, the one of the, the, the uh, perhaps final thoughts or closing thoughts I have about this is what we expect right now. So as we film, as we chat, um, we uh, have a vote tonight or expect it tonight. Not uh, us personally. Not us personally. But, but we expect a vote tonight. The world expects a vote tonight. I think I think it's going to be two, deal. two thirds against, one third for. I think it's going to be that. That's Possibly, the way it's I I I think that. Um, we are looking at uh, almost certainly the biggest revolt against the government um, in modern history. The biggest so far was one against Tony Blair in the Iraq war. Um, I was against the Iraq war. But remember, that was at least a vote that Tony Blair won. We're looking at not only a big revolt of people in parliament, the biggest uh, uh, group of, 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 of uh, the government's own party against them uh, we've seen uh, perhaps ever, but a vote that she's going to lose and calamitously. It could be the biggest ever. If it is something like 200 or more, I don't know how she, she lasts. But if Parliament can't agree this deal, if Parliament can't find some ready compromise pretty quickly, and what has led us into this situation is the government saying, well, look, it's the will of the people. Um, you know, we're just following the will of the people. The people wanted this. I do not advise the Prime Minister um, for lots of reasons. One of them, is that I am an advisor to the Labour Party. But um, I don't advise the Prime Minister. But That's a whole other video. But if I did, I'm going to give some free advice uh, to, uh, to the Prime Minister, and here it is. If I was Theresa May, and I am looking like I am going to lose big now, tonight, my advice to her, and I say this as a friend, in the interest of national unity, is I would actually call a second referendum. And I would call it, and this is not because I'm trying to say things that, that you or others want to hear or hope in here, et cetera, et cetera, but I would generally do this for her own self. Because if she can't get her deal, and she genuinely seems to believe her deal is the best way of delivering a Brexit, I would um, have this because she's got no hope of getting anything to Parliament. Her government will be paralyzed. It'll clearly, discussions will clearly be taken up by alternatives to her. She will be the bad person and everything else will be sold or presented as better than that bad thing that has been confirmed as bad um, tonight. So if she wants to rescue herself as the high priestess, the archbishop, the 
Pope of, of Brexit, or whatever the analogy we're looking or not looking for. Um, Baroness. Baroness of, of Brexit. If she wants to do this, then if she has a referendum on basically her deal or remain, what that does is allows her to go out as the only, and I would have it as that choice. If she adds no deal, no deal would split the Brexit vote, and it also then has a discussion around whether or not she has a real Brexit or not. If she's got the only Brexit, in, at least in her own eyes, in town, she yep. can then kind of be the champion of that Brexit vision. If she wins that referendum uh, vote, however fanciful, however difficult and impossible that is, she can then say, hey, look, members of parliament, the people have said they wanted Brexit. I've tried to deliver on that. We had a second referendum. The people have backed it. You back me too. Most of the members of parliament were for Remain. They then went behind the Prime Minister triggering Article 50 saying, well, hey, look, I still think Remain is best, but the people voted in that advisory yeah. um, vote and they went that way. That would help the Prime Minister get her way if she wanted to do it. But of course, if she lost, there's now, we're going, to, we're going to have to wrap this up because we're running out of tape. Her position would be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, but, uh, either way, but she at least saved some face saying, well, look, yeah. I, the public went for leave. I've tried to honor that. I presented the only deal possible. The public has changed their mind two years on. And there you are. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, I agree. People's vote is the only way forward, Teresa. Uh, so thank you very together. much for coming back and talking to me again. A pleasure. And uh, maybe we'll be able to do this again sometime when things have moved on. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining A me. A pleasure as always. Professor Tom Brooks. <laughs>